than that. I mean extremes. Uh, two days ago, what, it was 80 degrees or whatever. Uh, and, t and tomorrow it's going to drop and then it's going to do these things. And I think that keeps people sick all the time. But it also is a reason for not going to church. <laughs> I don't like cold weather personally. I'd rather have warm weather, hot weather, bump it up about another 20 degrees and I'm happy. Uh, when it drops down like this, uh, eloquence, blood thinner and all these things that you take when you grow old. You young people, you need to stay in the gym. You need to stay active and keep your body going because when you get older, it'll tell on you. Colossians, the third chapter, easy read. One verse, 15. Read with me. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Since as members of one body, you were called to peace and be thankful. Experiencing life together, growing together. You can change that way you want to, but I said experiencing life together. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for everything that you do in our lives. We're thankful for the spirit that endows all believers we ask that you speak to our minds with your thoughts that you would open our hearts with understanding and love for you and our neighbors it's in jesus name that i pray amen you know it's really beautiful when god's people live together in harmony that our lives is meant to be shared. That God expects, uh, intends for us to experience life together. That we're supposed to do that. He wants us to do that. The Bible calls this shared experience fellowship. And today the word has lost most of its biblical meaning like a lot of words. Like holiday. When I grew up, holiday meant holy day. Today it means a day off. Nothing spiritual. Fellowship now refers to a casual conversation, socializing, food, and fun. Stay after for fellowship usually means wait for refreshments. Real fellowship is more than just showing up at the services. It's being together. It's experiencing life together. It includes unselfish, loving, sharing, serving, sacrificial giving, sympathetic, comforting, and all the other one another commands in the New Testament. You know, there's a lot of do one another commands. When it comes to fellowship, size matters. Smaller is better. You can worship with a crowd, but you can't fellowship with a crowd. And once a group, group gets larger than 10 people, someone stops being part of that group. Usually the quietest person. Few people will dominate that group. I'm one of them guys. Put me in a group, I'll take over the group. I know there's probably everyone in here like me. Jesus Christ ministered to a small group of disciples personally ministered to him. The body of Christ, like our body, is a collection of many small cells. Christians need to be involved in small groups within the church. This is a beautiful church and it has 
small group behavior. It, most of it's on the Korean side, but it still works very well. Within the church, whether it's a fellowship group at home, a Sunday school class, or a Bible study, but in the church there are groups, and that's where the learning spiritually, that's where it happens. This is where the real communication happens. Our Bible study, it lasts 40 minutes, but we have some good times in the Bible study. Uh, unfortunately, we don't meet. We meet it on Zoom, uh, but it's working out for us pretty good. <clears throat> God has made an incredible promise with small groups of believers. He said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst. And we got that on the scripture. I didn't make that up. Matthew 18, 20. Two or three come together in my name. There I am in the midst. But unfortunately, being in small groups does not guarantee that you experience communication or the thing that God wants you to be. That's still up to you. True fellowship is not superficial. It's not a surface level chit chat. It's the real deal. It's genuine, heart to heart, it's gut level. We sometimes talk about things that you don't talk about anywhere else. It happens when people get honest about who they are and what's happening in their lives. They share their hurts and they reveal their feelings. That's what fellowship is all about. They confess failures, disclose doubts, admit fears, acknowledge weaknesses, and ask for prayer and help in prayer. We do that all the time. The truth is the opposite of what happens in churches. It's, churches almost becomes like a, a gossip column. Not here, other churches do. It, it, it becomes, people are afraid to talk like God wants us to do because it becomes a gossip. Who finds out first? Then there's the Spirit of God who endows us and convicts us. I don't know anything personally about anyone out here unless you tell me. And then I would never mention it in the church unless I told you I would. But the Spirit knows. So when you're feeling uncomfortable in church because of something the preacher said, it's probably the Spirit of God that's convicting you. It's certainly not necessarily the preacher. People wear masks. Not the COVID mask. I'm talking about the facade, the mask that you can't see. They keep their gods up. They act if everything is okay even when it's not. Everything is fine, but it's not fine. It's only when we become open about our lives that we experience real fellowship. The Bible says if we live in the light as God is in the light, we shall share fellowship with each other. If we say we have no sin, we are fooling ourselves. I didn't write that. That's 1 John, the first chapter, 7 through 8. It's right there in front of me. Take a look at that. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. The blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sins. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. You know, the world thinks that intimacy occurs in the dark, but God says it happens in the light. Darkness is used to hide our hurts, faults, and our fears, failures, and our flaws. But the light in the light, we bring them out all in the open and admit who we really are. You know, the truth sets you free, but only after it makes you uncomfortable. 
There are things that I used to wouldn't dare say in my life, but now I really don't care about them. And Clarence and I used to work together, and most of the people said, I'm always telling the same story. Well, that's just the way it is. I think if you tell the truth, it always comes out the same way. If you tell a lie, you got to remember how you told that lie. <laughs> Not here in the church, some other churches that way. It means fear of rejection. We don't talk about ourselves because we fear rejection, fear of exposure, and get hurt all over again. Why would you take such a risk? It's the only way to grow spiritually. It's the only way to grow spiritually and to be emotionally healthy. The Bible says, make this your common practices. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you can live together whole and healed. Look at James up there, James the fifth chapter. You can't make this up, it's in the Bible. Uh, if we read the Bible, we will see these kind of things. Therefore, confess your sins to each other. Pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. I love to hear my son pray. Because God blessed me to grow old and hear my son pray for me. That's a blessing that I have. We grow by taking risks. We grow spiritually. The most difficult risk of all is to be honest with ourselves and with other people. In real fellowship, people experience mutuality. The art of giving and receiving. Reaping and sowing, the Bible talks about. Depending on each other. You know, sometimes you just need to talk to someone. And then sometimes we don't need an answer back, just someone to listen. Sometimes we only need to sit and listen. The Bible says the way God designed our bodies is a model for understanding our lives together as a church. Every part depends on every other part. Everything in the church is just as important as that. Everyone in here, the person who cleans the church and the person who preaches the word of God is just as important to God. There is no special entities in the church. 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter. So there should be no divisions in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. Mutuality is the heart of fellowship. Building reciprocal relationships, sharing responsibility, and helping each other. Small groups work. Our praise team is a small group. Our study group is a small group. It goes like that. They work together. Paul said, I want to help each other. I want us to help each other with the faith you have. Your faith will help me and my faith will help you. Romans, the first chapter, 12th verse. That is that you, I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. Let me read that again. That is that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's fate. We are more consistent in our fate when others walk with us, when others encourage us, when we are able to encourage others. The Bible commands mutual accountability, mutual encouragement, mutual serving, and mutual honoring. The 12th chapter of Romans be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. The Bible says, make every effort to do what leads to peace and mutual edification. 
I think you should read the whole chapter 14 of Romans. I had that as a 1986 memory verse, the whole chapter. I think you read chapter 14, but I have extracted some verses out of it, 16 to 23. Do not allow what you consider good to be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and approved by men. Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and mutual edification. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All food is clean, but it is wrong for a man to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. It is better not to eat or drink wine or do anything else that will cause your brother to fall. So, listen to this one. Whatever you believe about these things, keep between yourself and God. I wonder if you looked at that closely. Blessed is the man who does not condemn himself by what he approves. But the man who has doubt is condemned if he eat, because his eating is not from faith, and everything that does not come from faith is sin. That's pretty plain. You know, if you read the rest of 14, you'd see the rest of that too. You are not responsible for everyone in the body of Christ, but you are responsible to everyone in the body of Christ. You got to think about that. God expects you to do whatever you can to help the body of Christ. In fellowship, people experience sympathy and empathy. And empathy is not giving advice or offering quick cosmetic help. Empathy is sharing the pain of others. Empathy says, I understand what you're going through and what you feel is neither strange nor crazy. I understand. That's empathy. And today, some call empathy, but the biblical word is sympathy. The Bible says, as holy people, be sympathetic, kind, humble, gentle, and patient. Colossians, the third chapter. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. That's hard for some of us. That not hard anymore for me, but it used to be very difficult for me because I could go from zero to go to jail in 20 seconds. I mean, completely freaked out 20 seconds. I could get that way. Only God keeps that part of me in check because I certainly can. And sympathy meets two human needs, the need to be understood and the need to have your feelings validated. Every time you understand and affirm someone's feelings, you build fellowship. The problem is we are often in such a hurry to fix things that we don't have time to sympathize. We don't even hear the conversation to put us at a level of sympathy. No, we are preoccupied with our own problems. Self-pity dries up sympathy for other people. If I'm all hung up on myself, there's different levels of fellowship and each one is appropriate to, at different times. The deepest, most intense level of fellowship is suffering. Suffering where we enter into each other's pain, grief, and we carry each other's burden. The Bible's command, share each other's troubles, problems, and in this way, obey the law of Christ. That's Galatians 6 chapter. Carry each other's burden, and in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. It's all there. It's 
beautiful. It's in times of crisis and grief and doubt that we need each other the most. We always do. When circumstances crush us to the point that our faith wavers, that's when we need believing friends the most. That's when we need to be able to call on a spiritual friend for assistance. We need small groups of friends to have faith in God for us and through us. In fellowship, people experience mercy, a place of grace where mistakes are not rubbed in but rubbed out. It happens when mercy overrides injustice. And we need mercy because we all stumble and fall. We all require getting back on track. You can be on the right road, but going in the wrong direction. We need to offer mercy to each other and be willing to receive it from each other. God says when people sin, you should forgive and comfort them so they won't give up in despair. In Second Corinthians, we almost there. <coughs> Second Corinthians, second chapter. Instead, you ought to forgive and comfort him so that he will not be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. You cannot have fellowship without forgiveness. And God warns, never hold grudges because bitterness, resentment always destroys fellowship. Because we are imperfect Sinful people, we hurt each other when we get together for a long time. When we get together for too long, we start beating each other up, don't we? It's like when the country don't have nothing external to fight, it fights itself. And sometimes we hurt each other intentionally, and sometimes it's unintentionally. Either way, it takes mercy and grace to create and maintain fellowship. And God's mercy is the motivation for showing mercy to others. You will never be able to forgive someone else more than God has already forgiven you. And many are hesitant to show mercy because they don't understand the difference between trust and forgiveness. Forgiveness is letting go of the past. Trust has to do with future behavior. Forgiveness is an immediate thing. Whether or not a person asks for it is immediate. Trust is re rebuilt over a period of time. God put each of us in this body and we have roles to play. We have things that he expects us to do. Love him with all our mind, body, heart, and soul and to love our neighbor as ourselves. But what if I don't like me? What if I don't like me? If I don't like me, I don't have to like my neighbor. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful for the life that you give us, the church that you've provided for us. Bless the families. Help us to understand each other better. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. We got to do the communion. So I need some help. <laughs>